Okay, I think we're all here. We're missing one person, but they should be joining soon. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So, hi everyone. Welcome to this first panel on platforms. My name is Anne Catherine Fay. Um, I'm an economist and a vice president at Analysis Group. Uh, it's an economic consulting firm based in Boston. I would like to thank first Danny and Dan for kindly inviting me to this conference. Um, I'm happy to be moderating this panel during which we will discuss three papers, um, all of which are related to platforms. Uh, in my work, um, I regularly consult to numerous clients on antitrust matters, often involving big tech and platforms. So I'm always eager to learn about the latest research uh, on platforms. And today, we'll learn more um, on the regulation of behavioral ads, um, the welfare implications stemming from the use of digital goods, and finally, the intersection of product development and fees on digital platforms. Um, Danny said this already, but before we begin, let me preview again our panel discussion and the order in which the papers and related comments will be presented. Um, so we have allocated about 30 to 35 minutes per paper. Each paper will be presented by its author, followed by two discussions, and finally we'll open the floor for questions, and we're hoping to hear from you for an engaged discussion. Um, so we had to make a few changes uh, but in the other, but we'll switch a bit to start with our first paper titled The Digital Welfare of Nations, New Measures of Welfare Gains and Inequality, presented by Avinash from Carnegie Mellon University. Or you can just sit here and turn on the mic. You can sit at the table. Uh, I had slides. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, great, great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, um, so today I'm going to present uh, some of my research on uh, measuring consumer welfare gains in the digital economy. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Eric Pernolfsson at Stanford uh, and several co-authors from uh, Meta uh, and JJ Lee also at Stanford. So this research is uh, motivated by the fact that, you know, we see the digital revolution all around us, except in metrics like GDP, productivity, and so on. So, you know, on one hand, you have, you know, an explosion of free digital goods, like most of us spend a lot of time online, you know, Google search, Google Maps, uh, and so on. Like today morning, I use Google Maps to, you know, find my way here. But on the other hand, if you look at the share of the information technology sector as a percentage of the overall economy, that share has remained at around 4 to 5 percent for the last 40-ish years. You know, so, so there's a separate debate about you know, whether GDP, productivity, and so on, whether they're properly measuring the productivity side of information technologies. So this research is not necessarily answering that debate, but rather looking at the welfare side. So, you know, uh, this is not to say that, you know, there are like issues with how we measure GDP and so on. So that's a different debate. Here we are looking at, you know, how do we measure welfare in this context? Because, you know, fundamentally measuring welfare is important for policy. Uh, uh. So, uh, yeah, so what do we do? So in our research, we do lots of online choice experiments to directly measure consumer welfare instead of trying to infer it from measures of production like GDP, productivity, and so on. Um, and we, we do these, uh, I'll, I'll describe further what exactly do we do, but you know, uh, we partner with Meta and we conduct uh, online experiments in 10 different countries, uh, in 13 different countries, and measure welfare gains from 10 popular digital goods. Uh, and we also compare, you know, our metrics with, you know, other metrics like, you know, time spent online or, you know, how much ad revenues do these platforms make and so on. So... In my previous research, so I've been working on this topic for several years, like, you know, uh, in some of my uh, previous papers, I don't know why it's not, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, in some of my uh, previous research, uh, I have uh, done similar experiments, partnering with you know market research companies and getting samples of users. Uh, one interesting thing which came out of this collaboration with Meta is we were able to get a big sample across several countries, and you know for every user in our sample, we have pretty rich way, uh, information about their weights, which tell us how representative a given user is. So using this, we are able to like scale up our data collection, measure welfare gains across different countries. So what exactly is this kind of online experiment we are doing? So the key online experiment which we do is a single binary discrete choice experiment. So there are no prices really, right, for like Facebook, Google, Wikipedia, and so on. You don't go and pay a price to use them. So what we instead do is, you know, we ask people, you know, like, if I give you like $5, you know, would you stop using a certain good for a one month or so on? Would you accept this offer or not? So doing these sorts of experiments lets us quantify, you know, uh, come up with an estimate for consumer welfare gains. And the price which we offer to different users is randomized across different users. And then when you aggregate data from all of these respondents, we can end up with demand curves. And we can do this with an incentive compatible design. So, you know, it's, this is not just a simple survey question, but in some cases, we randomly select some of these users and offer them real cash, you know, if and only if they stop using a certain product. So this is what we do with Facebook. So we partner with Facebook, you know, uh, try to measure how much do we have to pay someone so that they stop using Facebook for a month. You know, so take it or leave it offer. Sorry, this clicker is not, oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So we measure valuation of Facebook. So we randomly offer people prices ranging from $5 to $100. Uh, there is a one in 50 chance of getting selected. So if you are selected, then you know, and you say you'll go, you're gonna give up Facebook for let's say 20 or $30, then we give them that contract, you know, okay, your time starts now at the end of the month, once we verify that you have actually stopped using Facebook, you will get you know uh, cash in return. So this is how we this is the method we use to measure valuation of Facebook. And because we partner with Facebook, you know we can ensure that you know uh, if someone stops using Facebook, you know we uh, actually can check whether they have stopped using Facebook or not, and they get the monetary compensation if and only if they, they comply with the uh, choice they select. Sorry. Yeah, ne yeah, you can do next slide. Um, so for measuring valuations of other goods like Google, you know, TikTok and Instagram and so on, uh, because we are not able to partner directly with all these other platforms, what we instead do is we try to come up with an estimate of relative valuation. So we ask people to, let's say, make choices, you know, so if you could only, you know, pick... Uh, if you could only use Google or Facebook, you know, which one would you prefer? Or if you could only use Amazon or WhatsApp, you know, which one would you prefer? So making such pairwise comparisons lets us estimate relative valuations of these goods. And because we had, you know, uh, the dollar amount for valuation of Facebook and relative valuations of other kinds of goods, we can use these uh, numbers to come up with dollar estimates for like other apps, including Google, TikTok, and so on. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, this is very weak. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is what we do. So we measure valuation of Facebook and uh, 10 other popular goods, digital goods. So, you know, Google search, uh, you know, in the social media space, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok, uh, and WhatsApp, Google Maps, uh, and, and Amazon, and YouTube. Um, so... Let me show you some results now. Uh, uh, next slide. Yeah. So, oh, previous slide. Yeah. So, this is how the demand curve for Facebook looks like. So, on the x-axis, you know, uh, we, uh, you can see here the dollar amount. 
on the y axis it's the percentage of people who choose to reject the dollar amount and you know continue to use facebook so as we keep on increasing the dollar amount you know more and more people switch from keeping access to facebook to giving it up in exchange for cash so around you know looking at the results like around 19% have valuation of less than $5 around 24% seem to have valuation of over $100 and you know there is a lot of uh, heterogeneity in these results uh, uh, yeah yeah okay uh, so uh, the the valuations range from you know so across countries there is a lot of heterogeneity like you know ranging from 13 dollars in romania to around uh, 57 dollars in norway and these are the median valuations so across all goods in our sample, the median valuation for a month of Facebook is around $31. So once we have these dollar estimates of Facebook, using the other approach, we come up with relative valuations of different goods. So when we rank goods based on you know, most valued to least valued, Google search is by far the most valued product. Although you know, these experiments were done before ChatGPT came out, you know, so perhaps now that number may have gone down. Uh, you know, followed by, you know, we have next uh, YouTube, uh, Google Maps, WhatsApp, uh, and then, uh, you know, social media apps like Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, uh, and, and so on. So these are relative valuations. So, so let's look at some results when we compare valuations of goods across several countries. So, you know, we have the relative valuations of different goods, dollar estimates of Facebook. Using those, we come up with dollar estimates of, uh, you know, all these 10 different digital goods. Uh, and, you know, and when we add up valuations for, you know, for welfare gains from all of these 10 digital goods, uh, we come up with a, you know, number, which is uh, what we estimate is uh, these 10 digital goods seem to generate around $2.5 trillion in welfare across 13 countries in our sample. There is, again, you know, a lot of heterogeneity, you know, ranging from $13 billion in Romania to around uh, $1.3 trillion uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, these numbers look very high, but, you know, try to imagine a life without Google, WhatsApp, you know, and, and so on. So another interesting point to look at is to look at welfare gains as a percentage of GDP. So here what we find, interestingly, is, you know, uh, there doesn't seem to be, a, you know, there seems to be a negative association. So lower income countries, let's say in our sample, like if you, know, if you took, look at Mexico, what we find is, the welfare gains from these goods, you know, as a percentage of GDP is around 22 to 23% in Mexico. In the US, that's only at around 8 to 9%. So if you look at the curve on the right here, on the y-axis, we have, you know, valuations of these 10 digital goods as a percentage of GDP. On the x-axis, it's the GDP per capita. And there seems to be a negative association. And what this says is, you know, so digitization seems to reduce welfare inequality across countries. And, you know, the, the logic for this goes like this, you know, like, you know, even if you are sitting, let's say, in Mexico or the U.S., you still get access to the same Google search, the same WhatsApp and so on. And you get, you know, access to these goods without paying a price. So relative to your income, you know, uh, it makes sense that, you know, people in lower income countries would spend more of their budget on these free digital goods. We also have an analysis where we look at welfare gains within countries. So we have estimates for, you know, uh, the relative wealth for how, you know, how wealthy someone is, you know, with respect to the population of that country. Uh, so for every respondent in our study, we have a proxy for their wealth. So when we look at, you know, welfare gains within countries, what we find is, again, there is, if we look at Facebook valuations, there is no systematic relationship between how much people value Facebook and what their wealth is. So, you know, if you look at all the data pooled together, what we find is, you know, across low, medium, and high wealth groups, valuations of Facebooks are pretty similar. And, you know, combined, you know, what these two things seem to say is, you know, like uh, digital, digital goods seem to reduce welfare inequality. And again, you know, the logic basically is, you know, like no matter what your wealth is, you know, you get access to the same quality of Google search. It's not like if you're a billionaire, you get a better performing Google search, you still get access to the same Google search. And just to illustrate this example, you know, like we have like Elon Musk, for example, complaining about ads on YouTube, you know, like even though it's Elon, you know, and worth $100 billion, he still sees ads on YouTube, just like, you know, all of us. Um, 
A final analysis which we do is comparing our estimates of consumer welfare with other metrics like time spent online and how much ad revenues do these goods generate to these platforms. So here we only look at Facebook because that's where we have data on time spent and ad revenues. So very quickly to summarize, what we find is, you know, uh, if we look at, you know, how much consumer welfare people get versus how much time they spend on Facebook and split our data into low, medium and high time spent tercile groups. What we find is if you go from the low uh, time spent to the high time spent group, time spent increases like significantly almost by eight times uh, or 12 times. But the valuation of Facebook only seems to increase by around two times. And similarly, you know, with, uh, when we compare consumer welfare with ad revenues, we find a similar relationship here. So, you know, the, the ad revenue seems to increase, increase much more slower compared to how much people value different, uh, value Facebook. And, you know, the, the takeaway here is, you know, that time spent and ad revenue are measuring, uh, uh, you know, something which is different, uh, from what we are capturing in our consumer welfare metric. So, of course, there are lots of limitations with this analysis. So here we are only looking at, you know, the benefit side, you know. Uh, there are also lots of ways in which, you know, uh, there could be potential negative externalities, like, you know, impact on happiness, productivity, misinformation, polarization. Uh, there's also new research coming out which shows that, you know, these valuations may reflect irrational choices because you may end up with, uh, you know, uh, in a collective trap where, uh, you know, individually you may want to be part of these platforms, but you'd prefer a world where no one had access to these platforms and so on. And so I have some work looking at the negative externality side. Many others are also looking at it. And if you want a full picture, you know, we need to look at the benefit side, you know, and also some of these uh, negative uh, externalities. Uh, so so uh, I'll uh, uh, pause here and uh, looking forward to uh, comments from the discussants. Thank you. Thank you, Avinash. Our first discussion is Christopher from NYU. All right, thanks. Uh, and thanks for having me. I guess I should, uh, or can I, I can advance, good. Uh, I, should, I should do some very brief uh, uh, disclosure here. Uh, I have, my only consulting client in the last five years has been the policy office of the FTC, and they didn't listen to a word I said anyway. <laughs> so take that for, for what you will. Uh, I should also mention my sister uh, works for Facebook, uh, before that, but we don't talk that much. Uh, she, I don't even know that she likes me. She mostly just sends me pictures of my niece. Uh, so hopefully I don't get her fired for anything I'm about to say. Uh, great. Okay, good. So uh, let me just remind you why this is kind of a hard problem for economists, right? And so what we would like to do, right? And I'm going to, yeah, what we would like to do is know the area underneath a demand curve above the price that's paid here, right? Now, one challenge is the price that are paid for these goods are zero. So it's just all the area underneath the demand curve. That part is pretty straightforward. Um, and we're going to call that area underneath the demand curve, we call that in economics consumer surplus. And I'm going to be careful to use the words consumer surplus because I don't want to say consumer welfare because I'm in a room full of antitrust attorneys and whatever you think consumer welfare is and whatever I think it is, we don't have time to parse <laughs> what that's about. Okay, so we're going to sort all the people up, and we're going to we're going to try to figure out how much everybody who uses Facebook would pay for Facebook, and we're going to sort them from the, the most all the way down to the least, and we're going to try to figure out that area underneath that curve. Right? Now, typically when we do this in economics, the only data we have access to is some, some, something we call like observational data, Right? I see the prices in the market, maybe something goes on sale every six weeks or something like that, and I see a price change or something like that, right? And so I see these two points, price one and price zero, and I see these two quantities, quantity one and quantity zero, and then I have to do some extrapolating, right? I have to figure out, do I connect these two points with a straight line, with a constant elasticity curve, and so on? And you can see, like, the area under the red curve and the area under the blue line, even though they connect the same two points, could be very different, right? And where these are going to mostly differ are in the people who value the good the most, right? Like the really high value people. Now, this exercise is even harder because we don't see anywhere in the middle of that curve. All we see is this sort of green circle I drew way down on the bottom right there. All I see is what would happen if we didn't charge any price at all. We see a lot of people use something. And so now I have to figure out 
how much would people pay for something nobody pays for? And particularly, how much are the really, how many really high value people are there? Right? And so that's why this is hard. And so there aren't a lot of good options, but we've explored some of the not so good options in the past. Some by, you know, uh, Brynjolfsson and other co-authors uh, looking at exactly this question. So you can go out and ask people, how much would you pay for this thing? But there's two problems with that. One is you have to believe they're going to tell the truth, which they may not want to do. You know, maybe it's embarrassing to say I'd pay, a, you know, $400 a month to use Facebook. Uh, maybe I don't want you to find that out and then start charging me for it. Um, but the other question is, of course, like, if this is something we've never had to pay for, how do they even know the right number? Right? Um, and so people have tried other things, like comparing this to time usage. You know, we look at, like, and we see, like, man, you spend a lot of time on Facebook, so it must be really valuable. You spend a lot of time watching YouTube videos. Clearly, this is some really valuable thing. But a lot of that time may have been really low-value time you spent waiting for the subway or something. Right? And you would have just been staring at the subway wall, and the actual utility you get from this could be low. Right? And we know this from other studies of things like cable TV. There are some ch channels people are willing to pay a lot for, even though they don't watch them very much. That's like live sports games, right? You only watch this thing two hours a week. Willingness to pay for, you know, hardcore college football fans, hundreds of dollars a month, right? Kardashian reruns, HGTV episodes, things like this. Households watch an incredible number of hours of these things, but they're pretty close to indifferent between watching them and not watching that, anything at all. Right? And so you have to be a little careful. And so what do they do? They have this really nice thing where they can build this demand curve with this incentivized survey, where they say, look, how much would we have to pay you to drop Facebook? And by the way, you might actually get locked out of your Facebook account. Right? Now, it's a little bit friendlier than that. And compliance is not super high. Right? So in the end, Facebook has a trillion dollars. And only about 320 people actually get paid to not use Facebook. Right? So we survey 40,000. We're only actually, you know, the rubber hits the road only for a smaller amount. Right? And in fact, the question is, there's some breakage along the way. And maybe these are people who, when they said, oh, yeah, I would give up Facebook for $10 a month, when they said, okay, well, now time to put up. Oh, sorry, I didn't read the email. Uh, and so we have to be a little careful about that. Right? But this is still very cool. Right? This is like the best we can hope to do to nail this number. You know? Now, the ghost of Alfred Marshall says... For whatever reason in economics, we put price on the y-axis. And so these are not demand curves. These are all flipped. So just turn your head 90 degrees, and that's the demand curve. Right. OK. Uh, and they make some, in the paper, they make some comparisons with sort of both across country wealth and within country wealth and income and all this stuff. And it's sort of, you know, we find that the good news is that higher per capita GDP is associated with greater willingness to pay for Facebook. So one interpreter of that might be that maybe Facebook is actually some kind of leisure activity, right? And higher income consumers, when they have leisure time, you know, are willing to pay more for the leisure they have, right? The cross-country story and some of those other, you know, is this going to fix wealth inequality across countries? I think those, some of those stories are a little less clear, and I maybe wouldn't, wouldn't emphasize them as much. Oh, okay, so good. So now it's, we have, we're a room full of antitrust folks, so let me give you some quick antitrust, uh, uh, you know, uh, takeaways here. Uh, one is, if you were Facebook, you would probably look at this and say, hey, look at all the value we don't capture, right? Look at all the surplus we generate for consumers. You know, we're providing a lot of value. Uh, and so maybe regulating us would be bad for all of our users, right? Critics would say something like, look, this is some kind of surveillance capitalism. Facebook makes people depressed. You're the product, not the customer. Um, but the truth is, you know, people do only leave if you pay them quite a bit, right? In the U.S., it's about $50 a month to quit Facebook. And to put that in perspective, think about the things you do pay for. You know, Spotify is $11 a month. These are the prices, not the, the valuations, right? Spotify is $11 a month. Prime is $15 a month. The Washington Post, which you should all subscribe to, is $5 a month. Uh, American Express Platinum Card membership is $58 a month, right? So it's like almost as good as the thing that gets you into the airport lounge, right? Um, and so uh, the other way to look at this is to say, look, this is a two-sided market. Um, maybe Facebook users are just the American Express Platinum customers of the internet. You know, what do I mean by that? Maybe these are really valuable eyeballs to show advertisers, right? And in this world... Uh, maybe this makes merchants, you know, merchants, <laughs> right? The people who are buying the ads are, are also the same, 
Do I believe any of the things I just told you? Maybe not, but uh, you know, I'm putting it out. I'm just asking questions. Uh, and so, so, so I think that part is this part. I think of the paper is is really nice. I think what's less clear to me is, is sort of how we now are going to aggregate up and add in all these other services, right? So now we're going to ask you about uh, Google search and and uh, WhatsApp and TikTok and all these other things. And we're going to use your willingness to pay to sort of aggregate them up. But when we're doing this, we're sort of implicitly assuming all these values are independent when we total them up. And I think that's where we kind of get into trouble, right? As an economist, I'm always, ha I'm an IO economist, I'm happy to think about a world in what we call partial equilibrium, right? That is, if I'm going to look at just the market for cereal or just the market for cars, I'm not going to think about spillovers to the market for, for milk or repairs or other things, you know, trains and other things like that, right? We're going to think about what is the relevant market and what are the effects in that market. But now when we're going to total this across all these digital markets, I think we have to be a little bit careful, right? So giving up one good at a time is not the same as giving them all up at once. <coughs> um, so we have to think about, you know, if you're a really young user who doesn't really care that much about Facebook, but you really love TikTok, Right, we have to somehow think about how do we take that into account. Um, and so, let me just push push back on the on the big top line thing a little bit, because I think the question is like, are we getting GDP wrong? And I would argue, I, I don't think we're getting GDP as wrong as you think. So I don't know if people can see this. Can people see this so well? Uh, not so great. Okay. So what has gone up in price the most since 1985? So at the very top of the list, you have hospitals. That's not a surprise. Right, you have medical care is also up there, but number three or four on the list, what's gone up twice as fast as the price index is how much you pay for like cable and internet uh, and, and cellular services. Right, that's gone up a ton. So why does that matter? Well, last month, right, think about my bills. I didn't pay anything for Facebook. Right, I paid ten bucks or whatever for Spotify. But I paid $58 for a cell phone where I made two calls, right? I paid $65 for Verizon Fios so that I could have internet in my apartment. I also own a $900 iPhone, a $2,100 MacBook, and an $800 iPad Pro, which is definitely for teaching and not for watching movies on airplanes. Um, but if these things didn't have access to Facebook and Google Maps and YouTube and Twitter, why would we pay anything at all for them? Right, And so in the consumer surplus calculation for all of the complementary goods and services that I use to access the internet, right? Uh, you know, whether that's Apple products or whether that's Verizon or AT&T or whoever's giving me you know, the, the data services, you know, they're capturing a lot of that surplus too. Right? And one thing we have to be careful when we go to the aggregate level, when we go to GDP, is we want to make sure we don't double count things. Right? And so that's where I'll leave it. Thank you so much, Christopher. Um, I'll add a few comments of my own. And as a consultant, I also have to make my own disclaimer. I work with digital platforms, big tech. Um, but I would like to start by saying that I enjoyed reading this paper because it's truly, it's ambitious. We're talking about trillions of dollars here. But it's also highly relevant uh, for our times as we're going through a massive technological transition involving AI. Um, I think the intersection of welfare and the use of digitized um, digital goods, especially zero price goods, will continue to be scrutinized in the future as a potential avenue to leverage technology uh, for improving welfare and reducing inequality. So I'd like to say, as a practitioner, I think the paper would benefit from further explanation on the intuition driving certain results and from sensitivity analysis um, to test salient assumptions. First, I think the paper seems to assume that all in-person communications are equal um, and should be valued in the same way when one is facing different choices. But um, I wondered why was the category meeting friends in person chosen instead of other forms of in-person interactions? For instance, spending time with family or participating in community-based activities um, to support a charity. I think, you know, potential alternatives in terms of in-person communications could be considered here. Research has shown there's a growing prevalence of loneliness in high-income countries, 
which may affect the number of people with actual friends. I don't know about you guys, but um, relatedly, I think meeting with friends, um, if you have zero friends to meet with, this, you, praise, <laughs> you price that differently. Um, and it might be helpful to, to explain the intuition behind the choice of this in-person communication. Second, all 13 countries in this paper are among somewhat affluent countries. So there are no countries from South America or Africa. And in addition, the two selected Asian countries, Korea and Japan, tend to be considered high-tech countries. Um, I think it's likely not appropriate to extrapolate these results to other countries, especially developing countries. And we know from research, again, that um, in these countries, there's a growing and high usage rate of digital goods. And I think, as you acknowledge in your paper, if you extrapolate on inequality across countries, it's just very important to include developing countries. Um, third, the valuation of Facebook and other digital goods is calculated by income levels and education, but not by age. Um, I think the adoption rate of certain digital goods is influenced by age, as Christopher mentioned earlier. Um, for instance, TikTok users are likely younger than Google Maps users, and it might be interesting to see whether the results would still hold if, if, if this valuation exercise um, accounted for age the same way it did for income levels and education. And four, um, I was wondering whether the valuation would change if it was based on trade-offs against products people actually use. So the methodology was not clear to me here. Basically, as are Facebook users being asked about Snapchat, or are these Facebook users actual Snapchat users? They're currently using Snapchat. I think this distinction is really important um, because to avoid design and estimation issues, it would be interesting to run additional subsegment analysis on digital goods actually being used by Facebook users. Um, I would say in practice, survey-based choice experiments can be a useful tool um, to value a range of goods and services. These methodologies have been generally well accepted, including in courts in the context of litigation. However, their underlying assumptions and findings have been subject to high scrutiny and in practice, it's just really important to um, run additional sensitivity analysis to explain the intuition behind what's driving the results because bias can be easily introduced in some of these survey techniques and intricate analysis. Um, I'm stopping here in the interest of time, but I'm happy to provide additional comments separately. Any questions from the audience? I was curious how the following um, issue enters into this. There's data, um, there was recently, I think March of 2023, uh, University of Pennsylvania Annenberg School did a survey work on people's attitudes toward consent online and their, what their level of understanding is of what happens to their data, what's collected, how it's used. And it, sh it showed remarkable numbers with people's discontent and misunderstanding of what happens with their data. It seems like the valuation exercise that you're going through um, is, you know, very adept perhaps at catching the, you know, their view of the instant gratification that comes from using those services. But, you know, it's not a free service. Um, and they don't know the costs is what the data shows, that they don't know, you know, who's collecting their data, what's happening. And, um, you know, the data that's out there says that they're unhappy about that um, and they think that they're harmed by that. How does, um, in calculating sort of the, 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 the value here, how does that information problem that the people you're asking um, for feedback, 
um, that they seem unable to, you know, by the studies that are out there, uh, to include, uh, to, to balance the benefits? How does that enter in, into this? And do you think that um, the overall value to people and economies would be vastly overstated potentially because that may not be included? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So you're uh, exactly right. Like the valuations would depend on awareness about how the data is used and all that. So one, uh, one I guess, feature of this method is you could also try to get at it, let's say, by emphasizing, you know, what happens uh, potentially, like, you know, uh, what is the business model of Facebook or TikTok, and then explaining that and seeing if that changes valuation or not. So in this project, uh, we don't do that, but I have other work where uh, I, you know, we inform people about what happens with your data, like potentially data breaches or the revenue these platforms make from your data and so on. And that does impact valuations. So depending on the information, so people have information frictions. And if you provide some information treatments like that, that does impact valuations. Um, I guess the, um, you know, the, I, I would say that's like, you know, something we could do more. And this is the feature of the method, like, you know, uh, providing information, seeing how that changes valuations and so on. Uh, in the current analysis, we don't do that because we can only do so many things. There's like already lots of uh, data being collected, but I have other work where I look at that as well. But yeah, thanks. You have time for one more question, just one. Go ahead, Harry. <clears throat> of this conference, in the spirit of this conference, um, I want to suggest one change in your paper. It's the title. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the title set me off, actually. Um, the Digital Welfare of Nations. Great, sounds like Adam Smith. But um, the first thing I thought of was, so if the maker of fentanyl came to you and said, we'd like you to measure the welfare gains from fentanyl, all those happy users. I'm sure you would say, holy crap, how about the addiction? How about the costs? So there's been a lot of publicity about Facebook and its intentional addiction of users, particularly kids, with Instagram and Facebook. It's hard to get to the global notion that this is just great. It's, we're just trying to measure how great it is without you know, acknowledging that it isn't just great. Um, so maybe it's the title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, there are technical things, yeah. fine, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. I'd love you to change the title. The second point is I'd like to uh, underscore what Anne said. Um, if you are talking about inequality and so forth, um, a big story for Facebook in developing countries um, is the other side of the platform, is the use by advertisers. And Facebook's expensive. Um, and it, it does have effect on SMEs. It has effect on how those markets develop, some good, some bad. But um, you know, if you were going to make a claim to thinking about inequality and all of that, you'd really have to think about how it affects you know, the two-sidedness of it. Yeah. So... Um, you know, and then if I were Australian, where's Fiona? Um, I would say <laughs> they threatened to shut down our newspapers and to take, a, you know, to buy, buy information. They said, if you don't pass the law we like, well, God bless them. And then I would say, looking at this, I'd say, so who gave you these data? Oh, it was Facebook. Yes. And, you know, they're, they're not in the business of giving you stuff that, they know is going to harm you. So maybe it's the yeah. title, maybe there are other things that you can yeah. do yeah. Uh, in the paper. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, points well taken. A quick clarification which I wanted to make is um, we partner with Facebook. I, in an ideal world, I would like to partner with the other platforms as well, but they were the ones who were uh, open to this relationship. And one thing I want to mention is if you look at the data, most of the welfare, you know, Facebook is not up there in the list. Most of the welfare is coming from search engines, uh, from uh, uh, YouTube, YouTube is huge, uh, and instant messaging apps like WhatsApp. Uh, Facebook is there in that list, but it's not at the very top. Like, so most of the welfare you know, is coming from, so, so I don't want the takeaway to be a paper, it's not a paper about Facebook, it's a paper about measuring welfare or, uh, or consumer surplus from free digital goods. 
Uh, but point well taken about yeah, title and all. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, all. Thank you, Avinash. This was a great read. Um, I think we need to move now to our second paper. Okay, so hi everyone, good morning. So my name is Wei, I'm an assistant professor at CUNY Baru College. And so today I'm happy to present my work on product development and platform fees design with co-author with Avi Goldfarb and Litton Meta at the University of Toronto. So we know that in the very last few years, there has been a, a heated discussion about the platform fees and this associate uh, in-app payment system. So originated in 1980s that digital platforms has been adopting this 30% rule where for every $1 you make on the transaction on the digital platform, you need to pay about 30% of them to the platform itself. And this is long as the 30% tax or cut as from the developers has attracted a lot of attention and debate over whether this 30% commission fees are fair or whether the platform should allow developers to bypass the in-app payment system. And so we know from the newspapers that some of the developers, for example, like Epic, has brought up Apple and Google to the court, suing them over the practice of forcing everyone to pay 30% through the in-app payment system is unfair and anti-competitive. And actually, in just in the last few weeks, the, these two cases, just uh, the results just came up, that Google lost uh, the lawsuit at the, in the, uh, at the district, district court level, and, for the, and the Supreme Court refused to listen to the Epic and v Apple, and in the end, Epic has to, although it can use its own payment in pay, in-app payment system, it has to pay Apple still 27%. So while this debate still continues, one thing that we are certain is that the platform, the platform fee structure has been the center of many of these antitrust authorities around the globe. And so, for example, there are some notable regulations include the proposed open to app market Act in the United States, as well as the Digital Market Act in the European Union, and some other regulations include the, f the first regulation that imposes the restrictions on the platform fee structure is the Korean Telecom Communications Business Act. And in the center of these regulations, uh, how, uh, how to ensure uh, the fee structures are fair and that the developers have... Uh, are not discriminated in the in that payment system has been uh, the center of many of these regulations. But one thing that's still missing here is how would the platform fee structures affect the products affect offered on these platforms? And so this is the open question remains to be empirically investigated. And it's important because of two reasons. So first, the, we know that the software app development process is a dynamic process. So Given the fact that we know there's the famous long, uh, long tail phenomenon where the consumers, some, many of the consumers prefer the niche products on the platforms where they are not of many, that, that does not have a large cons customer base, that there's a number of products and the quality of the products in the long run matters for the success of the platform. And secondly, many of these new fee, new fee structures proposed by, for example, by Apple and Google, uh, in the, like the small business program introduced by Apple in 2021, is depend on the past performance of, of the of the product. So, investigating this how platform fee structure affects the product in a in a dynamic uh, scenario is an important question. So, in this paper, in this paper, we want to answer the question of how can the platform design uh, its fee structures to incentivize the innovation or the product development on the platform while ensuring its revenue. The idea is that if the platform has to reduce its fees, from, for example, like from 30% to 15%, on one hand, it lost part of the share of the pie for each transaction it incurred on the platform. But on the other hand, this will incentivize innovations in the long run so that the, the products are getting better and that new consumers will come in, and so that the overall pie will grow larger, so, to, so that we can com this, this can compensate the loss in the share of the pie. And to do that, we focus on a monopoly platform in the PC video game industry, and we collect the data on all the video games on this platform called Steam. 
So another reason that we chose this platform is that Steam is also a very old app market. It's as old as the app, mar- as app Store and Google Play. And it has this feature of letting the software developers to continuing uh, finishing polishing their product until they can fully re- release it. And so we adopt a different set of strategies to uh, understand and characterize the, de- the developers' decisions. So first, because we don't know, we do not know what kind of product development decisions they are making. So we employ the state-of-the-art pre-trained language models to on the news an- announcements of all of these softwares to to predict whether this app development process is. Uh, a major feature update, or let's say a minor bug fixes. And based on those characterizations, we construct and estimate a structure model of dynamic, dynamic games of like, so that in each period, a developer will decide whether to produce a major update or a minor bug fixes, and they can, and, or they can decide that they can finish and fully release the product to the market. And the key part of this paper is that in, in the counter, given this models estimated with the cost parameters, in the counterfactual analysis, we want to examine, let's say, if this monopoly platform is reducing its platform commissions, how would that affect innovation and the overall platform revenue? So the key findings we are as follows. So in the motivating evidence se- section, we've, what we find is that there's a positive correlation between the product development decisions and the sales and the, its reputation, meaning that if the, the developers are indeed making improvements to their existing products, the consumers will respond with like more purchases and better reviews. And on the other hand, in terms of the decision, product de- development decisions themselves, what we find is that different types of these development decisions are substitutes meaning that if you are producing a major feature update in the last period, you are, uh, less, uh, you are less likely to produce a, a minor bug fixes. And so and in the counterfactual simulations, if, when we are thinking about uh, whether reducing the platform fees will incentivize innovation, the answer is yes. So reducing the platform fee certainly guarantees more income for the developers and they will respond by producing more product updates, which is good for their own product. But does that mean that this, this, uh, the new demand resulting from the innovation would compensate the loss for the share of the pie in reducing the platform fees? The answer is no. So what we found is that this new, this new increase in demand is still small compared to the reduction of the share so that for the platform it may not be optimal for them to just linearly reducing the platform fee for all the products. Thank you so much Wei. Mm-hmm. Um, our first discussion is Kinshuk from Columbia Business School. Can I have my slides up please? <clears throat> Oh, all right. <laughs> Great. Thanks. So uh, my name is Kinchuk Jarev. I'm from Columbia. I'm a marketing professor there. So um, happy to be here. Uh, let me uh, give an overview of the paper. I really, really enjoyed uh, reading the paper. Uh, the question, right? So what is the question in the paper? I will turn back and keep looking at my slides. But basically, <clears throat> how, I think the main question um, is how do commission rates impact behavior of developers on an app platform? And so that's sort of the high-level question. The relevance is unquestioned, right? We saw example. I mean, we all know about it here in this room, and we also obviously motivated very well. So there's no no arguing or discussion about that. It's a very very important question. And so, what is the approach? <clears throat> the approach is uh, taking data from Steam, which is one of the biggest uh, gaming platforms. Right, and uh, they use uh, the authors use uh, cool ma- uh, machine learning techniques to sort of classify different updates, which are really behavior of, uh, um, of of the developers. Right, that's how they characterize behavior. That how much effort do you put in improving the product? Right, and then uh, along with that is uh, some econometrics. It's also very nice. 
Uh, and uh, given all of that, uh, what they find is the following. I think the sort of the high level takeaway would be that, uh, that, that lowering commissions will lead to more effort uh, by app developers in improving their products. Uh, at the same time, uh, the platform will is not so good for the platform because that increase in demand uh, from improving the product is not so much and doesn't really compensate for the decrease in sort of the what the revenue you make from the commission. Right? So I think at a high level, this is how we can think about the paper. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, you know, very enlightening in many many different ways. So let me offer some uh, thoughts on the paper. So, so let me start with the methodology a little bit. So there's a lot of text here on the slides. Um, but really, uh, wh what's happening here is that to increase, to understand the role of commissions, you know, which is the sort of the main question, what we would ideally need is vary, varying, exogenous variation in commission rates, right? That if, you, if it was different, what would be happening? Now we don't have that, and there's no hope of having any reasonable uh, data around that. Right? So the next best thing would be, okay, maybe it varies a little bit, maybe not exogenously, maybe not randomly, but it does vary. Right? Even that we don't have, at least in this data we don't have. Maybe we have it across platforms, we don't have it. Right? So, so then what is the approach? How do we understand the role of commissions? And at a, again, at a very high level, uh, my understanding of the paper is that uh, what the authors do is that they build a model of uh, developer behavior and you know of sort of demand and supply, and they uh, calibrate this using data on on from Steam, right? And one of the things that the authors say that helps them is this fact that there is this uh, program called the EAP program, early access program. Uh, and then it's launched on the main site, right? So what is the early access program? Well, the early access program is really giving developers an opportunity to uh, work on their, uh, on their app, on their game, while not being exposed to all the consumers, right? So being exposed to only a subset. So they feel sort of more free, you know, to, to understand uh, what is working and what all do they need to do. And when they are at a reasonably... Uh, comfort, reasonable level of comfort with their app, that is when they can launch it to the main site. Right? So the difference that is in the EAP, the early access program and the main site, is really how many, the, the, largely the, that it's a different number of consumers, also a different set of consumers. So I'll get to that. Right? Um, and then, so, you know, what is a commission? A commission is just kind of reducing your revenue. So different amounts of commission reduce your revenue. And so what they do find is that when you change the commission, uh, two things change. So number of apps released changes, and also the effort invested on average in an app also changes. Right? So that's sort of at a high level the methodology. Um, uh, so let me also, you know, by way of feedback, really offer uh, some of the uh, concerns that I had uh, with the paper. I mean, there's again, there's a lot of things to learn from it, and very, very interesting. Um, but there are, I did have some uh, concerns as well. And again, this is by way of feedback. Right. So um, uh, one of the chief concerns is that the data for calibration is actually from the EAP, from this test site, quote unquote, right. Um, on which consumer visibility le is less, right? So the authors state that identification is coming from different behavior of developers on the EAP and the main site, which, you know, I feel that, yes, it might help in identifying the model, but, like, isn't that part of the, the issue a little bit? Because there is self-selection in who is on the EAP versus who is on the main site. Right, so there. Uh, in fact, the authors are very upfront about it in the paper that only consumers who want to uh, access the test site actually go there. Right, so it's not like a random sample of all consumers that you would be finally exposed to, and even developers are smaller developers. Right, so this definitely helps. Right, to understand what's going on, but we have to keep these caveats in mind that the that that a lot of the action is not for Sort of a representative sample of the main site, and so where, so how broadly is this applicable? Uh, and just we just have to be careful uh, with that interpretation. And 
A couple of some specific things, right? So one of the very interesting parts of the paper was the counterfactuals where the authors are changing commission rate, right? And there's a, a table there. So what you can say is that 30% is the baseline commission rate, right? And uh, then there are percentage changes relative to the baseline. If you look at the lower part, the lower half of this, say that how do different types of behavior change when commission rates are different? So all the way to 0%, which is no commission, 12%, which is, you know, some common somewhere, 20, and then 40. So some few below 30 and one below 40, right? So uh, uh, here I, I just, uh, the only, the, the way I, what I did, so I had a couple of uh, uh, things I didn't quite understand uh, about this. So what I did was I remade this table just to order the columns by commission, right? So if you have 0% commission, right, what we see is that uh, if you look at the regular, so so anything, if you look at the black rows, you know, the behavior below 30% and above 30% has opposite signs, which sort of makes sense. But in some of the release decisions, which is how many apps are released, for any commission rate different from 30%, it's always lower. So I wasn't really able to understand that, and I didn't find a discussion of that in the paper. And I was wondering, like, what what is it that's causing that? Why is... Why is there always few apps if you leave the 30% rate? And also the, a certain kind of updates. Uh, you know, sometimes there are more, sometimes there are less. It doesn't seem to be a pattern with commission rates. So uh, just you know, some more discussion in the paper about that specifically, I think, would be helpful. This is very sort of specific feedback. And uh, then on the last slide, I think one could think of that um, you know, what is a good commission rate for the developer? So let's say it's something between 0% and 100% you have to be set. Well, 100% is no good, and nobody's going to make anything. 0% uh, is that good, right? Well, if the problem is that the platform may not be able to run. But I think uh, one sort of conceptual level concern I have about the framework is that the paper actually allows 0% as an answer. Uh, but then, you know, uh, but I mean, I think there's a reasonable argument to be made that 0% is not going to work because the platform also needs, maybe they don't need 30% to run the website, to run the app store or the, uh, or the site. Uh, but you know, if, if they're at 0%, well, I mean, maybe they can't provide maintenance or security or marketing, and then maybe the developers again won't develop, right? So, uh, again, there should be probably something in the model that stops commission rate from going to something very low, uh, because then the apps just won't work. And I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Kinshuk. Our second discussion is UJ from Compass Lexicon. Um, thank you, Kinshuk. Thank you, Ray. Um, it's a great honor to be a discussant here today. Um, and piggyback on the methodology discussion, I'll just be sharing some thoughts as an, an, as an antitrust practitioner. And it goes without saying that my presentation does not represent the view of Compass Lexicon or its uh, clients. Uh, your, uh, is it? Is there's a mic on? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm trying to turn mine on. I did. Yeah. How about now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so I uh, enjoy this paper and I read it as a very timely contribution to the debate on uh, commission rates. Uh, as we already introduced, the, the 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 background of the debate is common. The, the commission fees are the commissions are typically viewed as a tax. Um, they are more like uh, value transfers that with, with potentially distortionary effects. And then with that line of thinking, it's natural to think that okay, let's focus on the level, and then maybe it's better to have a lower rate. Uh, and then this has also informed um, enforcement efforts in the sense that. Uh, both agencies and private parties have uh, brought lawsuits against the platforms, uh, alleging that the, the commissions are too high, and then the citing series, series of harm, including you know, uh, too much extraction of surplus from uh, the platform users, uh, uh, reduced incentives to innovate, uh, and also uh, putting too heavy a burden on the smaller participants, both developers and typical um, and merchants. Uh, and in response to that, the defense put forward by the platforms are also typically focusing on the level and trying to justify it by saying, you know, we're charging a similar rate as our competitors, 
uh, they do not lead to abnormal margins compared to, again, the competitors, uh, or saying that uh, the commission rates are not raised uh, even after the platforms receive much more uh, adoption when we actually uh, when they actually become an important thing in uh, in the life of the uh, of the users, uh, well, of course, the, all of these considerations are super important. Um, I think it's also worth bearing in mind um, that the the fees the fee structure on platforms have very important uh, policy functions in a sense that we we know for a very long time that uh, in some some cases it's socially optimal to subsidize a group of users on a platform if they bring a lot of values to the others and then attract more to join. Um, and to give another example in the gaming industry, um, nowadays a lot of developers would put uh, millions into developing a game and then make it free to play uh, to a large base of users. And once these users come and then establish active engagement, um, they will try to identify a small group of individuals with very high uh, willingness to pay for special uh, Items and then they monetize over uh, uh, off of these people, um, and then one could argue that's a scenario that most people are happy. People, uh, the developers get paid, and then the players get games to play. Um, so, looking back at the, this paper, we see a scenario where uh, simply lowering the commission fees does not necessarily lead to um, the best outcome for the players. So, here we see a scenario where lowering fees push pushes some developers less towards less likely to release uh, the final product in, on the big platform. Um, and then this speaks to sort of the multidimensional decision platforms need to, to, to think about. Um, and I would like to uh, argue that this is not an exception. Uh, we, if we look at the relatively small amount of variation across uh, commission fee schedules on the major platforms, uh, it's very easy to notice how the small variations themselves uh, can have different and important implications uh, for how uh, the participants re uh, behave. So for uh, the, the Steam example, um, developers opt in into different markets, and of course that's driven by different uh, fees they face. And if uh, the commission rates are vary by cumulative revenue, then that's going to um, affect how developers choose their growth strategy, how much they put into marketing, uh, and then when they're hitting that threshold over which they, they, are, they face uh, a higher commission, they might think differently about um, how aggressively to acquire new users and how, how much innovation to put in. Um, so uh, within that context, I think I would like to argue and uh, um, put it to the audience and the, the relevant researchers. I, th I think that it would be uh, nice to focus more on the multidimensional aspect of uh, platform fees instead of just looking at a unidimensional level. So the question maybe would be, how do we structure the, the uh, a menu of uh, fees instead of just focusing on one uh, uniform level applicable to everyone? Thank you, UJ. Um, we have time for one or two questions. Back of the room. Yeah, I guess I was just very curious about the methodology that was used specifically with the use of Steam uh, because of how unique Steam is in terms of its platform compared to other platforms like Epic Games, for example, wherein you have uh, aspects where developers have um, access to uh, the gamification of the platform, so the use of trading cards that are associated with the game that are outside of the actual game, or backgrounds that you could use for a person's uh, profile uh, that are just associated with that game. And I, I was just curious in terms of like this dimension that we uh, or the 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 fee structures that exist there. I was wondering, are there other factors that might make Steam a little unique in which developers are willing to pay a lot? more in terms of like the fees that they are on that platform compared to uninnovative platforms like Epic where all you're doing is just launching a game and that's pretty much it. So I was just curious to see if maybe there might be a little look into see how different uh, that fee variable is compared to platforms that have these innovative features that are outside of the actual video game that developers are playing versus, uh, or the developers are creating as opposed to just putting it on other um, uh, platforms like EA or 
Blizzard or um, Epic. Yeah, thanks for the question. So yeah, so I agree that there for some games there are other kind of like in game uh, outside the game features that can have some like like a trading market that can create the additional value for cons- consumers. So uh, in this paper, we're focusing on games in early access or the public beta testing program. Is the main the re- main reason is that these products uh, their their main source of revenue is just by selling the product itself. It does not have uh, the downloadable content, it does not have that much trading cards and stuff like that. And the reason that we chose Steam is that Steam is one of the market that had, that's more, more similar to App Store and Google Play because it has this reputation system, it has this regular update uh, for uh, options for the product, whereas for platforms like EA, EA Play or Epic Games, there's simply there's no consumers' participation in terms of the reputation or stuff like that. So it's more like a storefront. But for Steam, it's more like a two-sided platform. That's, yeah, that's the reason we chose that. Thank you. One last question. Uh, this is not coordinated, but my question is very similar. Um, in, in many of the plaintiffs versus Google or Apple cases where the plaintiff is either a state enforcers or Epic, um, the plaintiffs like to decompose the commission into a payment processor fee and the um, platform or marketplace or network effect fee. And they'll say, well, the payment processor fee is comparable to a uh, donut shop uh, using Stripe or um, Square to process payments. They charge about 3% per transaction. So the actual charge or the cost of processing the credit card payment is about 3%, give or take. The other fee, the twenty-seven, the additional 27% then should be attributed to the value that the network or the platform provides. If you buy that analysis, um, should we then start thinking about what the value added is of Steam compared to uh, Google's Play Store or the App Store where the network effect may not be as prominent as that as it is in Steam. Uh, I'm not sure if I perfectly understand your question. So, uh, can you elaborate more? Sure. So, um, the commission is thirty percent, and plaintiffs often will argue that this thirty percent is part of it is for the actual processing of the credit card payment, so the back end interchange fee and payments to Visa and Mastercard and the banks. The other bit is the value that the platform brings to the overall ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And the argument plaintiffs will make is, well, you can use Square or Stripe or any of the other mainstream um, payment processing platforms that you can use to process a credit card payment. I have a Square um, Square Squares um, that I just got for free because it seemed cool. They charge about 3% every time I swipe a credit card. So when I was a poor grad student, I could just swipe my credit card, get about ten thousand dollars in my bank, pay the three percent fee, and and you know pay that card off two years later. But that's not the point. The point is um, that payment processing platform can charge charges about three percent. So the other twenty seven percent then is the value that the platform provides to the ecosystem. So my question is, does that make sense? And if it if it does then should we start thinking about how Steam is different or similar to Google Play along those dimensions? Okay, yeah, thanks. I think for the 30%, uh, I, I was reading an article and it says like, this number actually originated in 1980s when like two game developers are are like having a deal with Nintendo. of like, And this uh, 30% is actually a combination of 10%. I think it's 10% of, like, for the platform and 20% for producing the, cat, the video game cartridges. And I think for, if I understand correctly, I think Apple, Google, and Steam, and many other platforms, they just simply adopt the 30% number. I don't think they have a very good justification for that part. Yeah. Thank you, Wei. Uh, we now have to move to our final third paper presented by Crystal Ball from Cornell University. Okay, so can I have my slides, please? Yeah, yeah. yeah. next. Oh, next here. Then, okay. 
Okay, thank you. This work I'm going to present is joint work with my PhD student, Pega Moradi, and with Alessandro Quisti. So the motivation of this work, why we, we wanted to write this paper, is because when looking into behavioral, behaviorally targeted advertising, we notice that there is a tension. We have some people that argue for more regulation, and the people that, come, that argue for this are typically privacy scholars, privacy advocates, and they justify the need from like legal and ethical grounds, like more reasons like mitigating discrimination, preserving decisional autonomy, et cetera. And then on the other side, you have the advertising technology firms that uh, resist regulation or try to influence it by citing economic studies that uh, the ones they're citing argue that regulation would hurt many stakeholders participating in these ecosystems. So what we wanted to do was to look at the theoretical literature, at the uh, empirical literature on economics, and see if we could find grounds, like economic grounds, that would justify uh, regulating behaviorally targeted ads. And we're interested in, in two things mainly, uh, looking at the cost and benefits that are created by behaviorally targeted advertising, and more importantly, on how these costs and benefits are allocated across different stakeholders. So just to give you an example of what I was mentioning before of the ad tech industry uh, resisting regulation or privacy initiatives, uh, when Apple introduced their tracking transparency framework, um, Facebook, Facebook was very vocal against it. They mounted a national campaign. They bought full uh, page ads on national newspapers saying that this was Apple versus the free internet. Like this change was going to affect uh, the cooking blocks that you like, the apps that you download, and uh, it was going to be bad because if these uh, products couldn't use behaviorally targeted ads, uh, they were not going to make enough money, and they were going to re uh, be less, go out of business, reduce their quality, or change their monetization uh, strategy. So with co-authors, as a side note, with co-authors, we actually investigated this claim after ATT was introduced in the Apple app ecosystem. Uh, we look at entry, exit, updates of apps, rating of apps, and we don't find any evidence of this really materializing after the, this change was introduced. Okay, so uh, I don't think I, I need to explain much what behavioral online advertising is. Online advertising started around uh, 1994. It has continued to evolve in, in these 30 years. And now it has evolved into a complex system that has many advantages that arise from online context. So online ads I have lower costs of delivering them, tracking them, targeting them, measure, measuring their effects. Um, moreover, by accumulating data on consumers, uh, advertising technology firms can learn what people are interested on and deliver ads on things that people are likely to like. Uh, you, you avoid the problem of showing an ad that is irrelevant to someone. Uh, and finally, these ads are being allocated uh, using real-time bidding auctions. And this is good from an economic standpoint because it makes the pricing and the allocation of the ads efficient. Uh, the advertising technology firms highlight these advantages, but then if you ask uh, other players in the ecosystem, if you ask uh, advertisers, if you ask publishers, if you ask users, they have uh, different views. I mean, advertisers have been complaining a couple of years ago, the um, CEO of Procter & Gamble, who is one of the major advertisers, uh, mounted, like, made his purpose of the year, highlighting how this was not working for them. Publishers, there are two newspapers going out of business every week, and users, well, users have been complaining about that for a, uh, quite a long time. I teach a market design class at Cornell, I usually ask my students, what do they think about advertising? And this is the word cloud that it comes out. If you look, many of the words that come out are, are negative sentiments. I mean, to, to be fair, there is also positive things that they mentioned, but I would say that the balance uh, leans more towards the negative things. Okay, so when you look at the theoretical literature, uh, this literature really is kind of nuanced on what it predicts. There are studies that argue that more regulation would be bad uh, and would have like negative welfare consequences. And the reasons used in these models is that uh, targeting, behaviorally targeting, uh, increases 
or improves the matching between buyers and sellers. And if you remove this ability to target, um, then there's obviously going to be uh, negative welfare consequences. However, there are many other models uh, that say that actually regulating uh, behaviorally targeting uh, can have positive welfare consequences and not just for some agents. Uh, there are models that even argue that this could have positive consequences uh, in a, from a societal perspective. Uh, why this could be the case? Because uh, these targeting technologies could be used to improve the matching between consumers and, um, and sellers. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. I mean, the, the, the ones controlling the technology, the ones controlling the data, is the advertising technology firms, uh, and they design the marketplaces, and they could do it in a way in which um, it produces an outcome that doesn't necessarily benefit consumers, that mostly directs the surplus that is being generated to them. Uh, another reason that, that uh, comes up is that behaviorally targeting and the, and the concentration of advertising technology firms can lead to a model in which the competition between advertisers is exacerbated in a way that doesn't really create value. To exemplify what I mean with this, uh, imagine that you are searching for a new pickup truck, which is a popular vehicle in upstate New York, and you go and search for a very specific brand and model. So I went to Bing here and I searched for a Chevrolet Silverado. And then what comes out in the search results, like to begin with, most of the page is covered by sponsored results. So these are not organic results, these are uh, results that were allocated by uh, an auction. The first result that you see is not what I was searching for using the trademarks and the model of a specific vehicle, it's the product of the competition. And this happened because uh, Ford just happened to be higher than Chevrolet and got the privilege of when someone searched for the trademark and the model of my competitor, I get to show them my product. Um, so I find hard to believe that this is something that is really reducing search and transaction cost. It seems to me more that this is a, this is a model in which uh, the platform is taking advantage to uh, engage competitors in kind of a zero sum advertising game. Okay, so uh, to put this, like this is a very specific example, we can think in more general terms how this could operate in a framework. Uh, these figures come from a paper that Alessandro Quisti wrote in an NBA and a chapter on the economics of privacy that the NBR published last year. Uh, the way he explained this is that you can think of online advertising in two different frameworks. There could be a framework in which you focus on the on the matching benefits that the intermediary has. So the intermediary creates, creates economic gains by uh, accumulating data and using targeted technologies, and then these gains are distributed to the different stakeholders. So they reach publishers, they reach consumers, they reach merchants. Uh, an equally valid uh, framework is to, instead of focusing on the intermediary, as a, or focusing in the matching benefits of the intermediary is focusing on the dynamics of the different players. So here you have a model in which you have atomized consumers that have limited budgets and limited attention. You have publishers that are also atomized and are competing for the attention of consumers to show them their content and the ads that goes with it. And then you have atomized merchants that are competing with each other. Uh, at the center of this model, you have uh, an oligopoly that controls the advertising technology firm, and that could take advantage of this competition to sort of extract surplus uh, from uh, these market participants. Okay, so turning into the empirical evidence, uh, it, this is interesting because there are many stakeholders and most of, this, of the studies have been concentrated on merchants. When we look at data intermediaries, there isn't much uh, academic work looking into it, but we can look at industry figures. Uh, Meta, Google, and Amazon control 65% of all ad, digital ad revenues, and this is a 300 to 400 billion uh, industry in a year. Meta and Alphabet, that derive most of their uh, profits from advertising, have an operating profit margin of about 25%, which I think every business would like. Uh, but 
there is also other players, and there isn't much known on how like the hundreds of other players in the data intermediaries space uh, capture benefits that are being created, how they are getting distributed. Looking at merchants, there is a lot of work that has been done. Most of this work has focused on measuring how effective targeted ads are. And what they typically do is compare how targeted versus non-target ads, ads perform in terms of click-through rate, conversion rates, etc. Uh, results suggest that targeted ads are very effective. However, uh, these results, we have to look at them carefully because it's really difficult to identify causal effects when you're doing behavioral targeting. Uh, at the extreme, you could think of a targeting technology that is so good that it's going to identify the person that was going to buy your product anyway. So you show them an ad and they buy the product and they click on the ad uh, and it looks great on paper. But the lift that you really created by showing them an ad is really not, not as good as it looks. Uh, there are words that have tried to disentangle this relationship and they have done uh, great work, uh, but it's very uh, dependent on the context, on the ad types, on the platforms, and it's generally limited to, to limited context because it's very hard to do and you require very complete data. From the side of publishers, there have been some uh, research done on how much publisher benefits from uh, targeted ads. There was one notable study by Google in which they did an experiment where they switch off uh, like cookies, which is the, the, the technique used to track and target users. And then they compare how much they were paying to publishers when uh, the cookies were turned off and when the cookies were turned on. And they find a 64% reduction uh, for non-cookie transactions. Other studies have uh, found like much smaller numbers in the order of 4%. So the issues with these studies is, is sort of uh, is sort of a partial versus uh, is a partial equilibrium story. In the case of Google, what they are really measuring is how much they pay for a targeted versus an untargeted ad. That doesn't mean that in a world with privacy regulation, all the advertising revenues are going to go down by 64%. The publisher uh, could use other uh, exchanges, they could use other targeting technologies such as contextual targeting or uh, targeting technologies that are less invasive, uh, and these, those figures would probably not hold up. Lastly, in the side of consumers, there are two effects that are worth uh, considering. One is on the, what is the effect of regulating privacy on the availability of free content. There is several studies that have been done in the context of GDPR. Something to, to, to look into those studies is that many of them look at the short term, like what happens like three months after GDPR, six months, and they find an effect. Uh, my own work that looks sort of a longer context, so looking at what happens a year after, 18 months after, uh, find that those effects tend to, uh, tend to level out over time. They, they tend to, the markets tend to recover. Because mm -hmm. the, 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 um, the, these industries like, adjust to a new regime and find ways of being profitable in, in, in a more restrictive privacy regime. I mean, after GDPR, we have not seen uh, publishers going out of business in the EU. We have not seen the collapse of free content and services in the European Union. The second aspect that has not been studied much about the effect of behavioral targeting on consumers is how it di directly affects them, like how advertising exposures affect your online experiences, uh, how like your purchases, your satisfaction with purchases. Uh, with one of my PhD students, we just finished a study in which we do something uh, similar to what Avi presented in other contexts. The difference is that we ask uh, them to stop using their ad blocker or to start using an ad blocker, and we find very significant effects of that intervention on their online experiences, in their satisfaction and regret with recent purchases, and even in their subjective well-being. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to end here. Thank, Thank you, you Cristobal. Um, our first discussion is Ginger from the University of Maryland. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, slides, please. You have to click next. Oh, yes. I have to click next. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for giving me opportunity to uh, read this uh, interesting review paper. And let me summarize that a little bit first. 
Um, so um, I think it asks a great question. It's what's the welfare um, effects of behavioral ads taking all stakeholders into account? I think that's kind of a common question for this panel, but I think it's, it's good to put that question uh, at front of center. Um, it also contrasts two views. The industry was thinking, okay, we're talking about a win-win-win-win situation for consumers, for publishers, for merchants, for the intermediaries, while um, others, uh, especially lawyers um, in like um, people's rights or other areas would argue that individuals' liberty, um, equity, or autonomy might be harmed by this um, widespread data collection. So I think this paper really asks good questions, say, what if we just look at economic studies? What is the overall welfare effects here, especially what's the distribution effects, how the benefits of this um, new business model has been allocated across different stakeholders. So I think that's a great question. That That's kind of the question that we need to answer before we decide which regulation or whether regulation should be there or not. Um, as um, Christopher has explained, that's um, when we look at economic literature, it seems like the answer is quite nuanced, both theoretically and empirically. They also identify a lot of research gap in this area. So I would encourage all of you to read their paper carefully to maybe you can know where your next project is. I also appreciate they have a list of potential solutions to the problem. I think that's a good um, conversation start for maybe the coffee break on uh, exactly which was the pros and cons of each solution. Um, for this discussion, I would I just want to focus on the big picture. Um, I really love this graph. They kind of contrast two views. On the left is this industry view that's, okay, the new technology of behavioral ads bring benefits because the matching efficiency has improved. Consumers have more um, products to consume, maybe enjoy lower prices. The merchants and publishers have better way to reach their target audience. The intermediaries earn a fair share of their profits out of the better technology. So it seems like everybody is better off from this thing. But on the right, you can see that every party here may have a as something next to their name, right? The consumers may have uh, limited attention and they're, um, they're, they're constrained in their information set. The merchants and publishers may be be forced into this prisoner's dilemmas game. Everybody have to compete hard and pay high advertising price, but what they're getting is not better in terms of the acquired customers, what type of customer they acquire. It seems like the, the big player that gain from this whole thing are the intermediaries or maybe very few intermediaries who are able to extract surplus from everybody else in this market. So these two are very contrast views of, um, of the big picture. Um, I want to make a few comments. One is I think a crucial part is how we understand the consumer gain out of this, right? To what extent consumers really enjoy from those digital products and services enabled by behavioral ads. And they're absolutely right that this is not just direct better match of, say, golfers are able to find the next generation golf clubs, okay? It's also on the digital services, the free services that we all enjoy because the behavioral ads enable the platform to offer those free services. I think Avinash um, research has, has been a great start in that direction. However, if we're talking about regulation, the regulation is likely to affect, if not every platform, but a lot of platforms that offer this kind of services, right? So maybe the right counterfactual is not like, what if we turn off Facebook, but keep everybody else um, online? It's more like, what if we go back to the world without a um, search engine, without social media? <clears throat> how that world <clears throat> looked different from today's world when almost every ads enabled digital service is quite different. Okay, I, I think that's a very hard question to answer, but I feel like that's the um, that's probably the most question we need to answer. That's what's the what's the benefits of such reduction of search costs. The second one is um, okay. I, I know some publishers, some merchants have um, voices, their concerns, their legitimate concerns, but just from 
the social planner's perspective, is profit the right measure? Should we also consider, say, for example, consumers may benefit from this, say, through lower price or more products, even though the publisher and merchant's profits have gone down and maybe close to zero or even below zero? Okay, so that, that's one question. Um, another one is, um, I think we probably want to consider both the old and the new players here. It's concerning that newspapers, traditional newspapers, has been exiting the market at the very um, very uh, high speed, but at the same time, we also see new content providers come up, right? If you look at the number of musics, it has tripled from 2000 to 2008. I'm talking about digital music, okay? If you ask how many uh, new videos are up every day on YouTube, that's like 3.7 million, okay, per day, okay? The kind of content enabled by such digital behavioral advertising I think that has to be considered as well as we are um, thinking about the exit rate of traditional media such as newspapers and TVs and other things. Okay, so that's on the um, publisher and merchant side. And finally, on the, um, the intermediaries. I, I know a lot of intermediaries such as Google and Facebook, their profit rate seems pretty high. They really enjoy a lot of profits out of this. And we're all concerned about the concentration in this industry. But I think a deeper question we have to ask is what drives that concentration? Is that because Google or Facebook or other platforms has been engaging in certain monopolization acts? Let's say they set up artificial barriers to entry so that a competitor cannot come in. Okay, or maybe they somehow trick the users to give away their data without sort of full knowledge of exactly what they're giving away. And I think these are the hard questions antitrust agencies and consumer protection agencies are looking at and they should be uh, looking into. Um, however, I think there are also other explanations such as maybe it's more efficient to do the advertising this way because digitally we can have better idea of who is wanting what, and what will be defining the better match value. Um, so I, I think that efficiency part, which at least in my mind should be considered, that's to what extent is the efficiency driving the concentration. Maybe there is a value for Google or Facebook to know everybody, everything, so that the matching will be much more um, easy to do and valuable than having segmented newspapers or, or other traditional intermediaries. So I, mean, I, I think these are just the two sides sort of juggling in my mind while I'm reading um, the paper. Um, next, I want to ask um, questions like, I mean, if we're thinking about regulation, what is the goal of regulation? It's, when I read the paper, I got the feeling that, okay, maybe we're only allowing Pareto improvement, means that somebody is better off without anybody else worse off, okay? Are we saying that we only want to go for such an improvement if the improvement is Pareto? And even that, it seems not obvious to me because somebody may lose out of this, right? Let's say inefficient merchants or publishers or intermediaries may exit the market and become worse off in this new world. So this is not Pareto improvement from their perspective, right? So do we want to kind of avoid that outcome as well? So that, that's just one question. Um, another one is, okay, I, I got the point that we need concern about the distributional effect, but I want to push it a little further. What distributional effect are good enough for us to say, okay, that's good enough, there's no need for regulation, okay? And um, maybe all of us would agree that if the distributional effect is such that we only have one or two intermediaries earning huge profit and everybody else is worse off, and that's not desirable, that sounds like a monopoly. But what do you say, okay, intermediaries earning a lot of profit, consumers are getting positive on the net, okay, but merchants and publishers, some are positive, some are negative, how we trade off that distribution? Is that distribution non-desirable enough that we need some regulation, right? This seems like a continuum spectrum there where we're gonna draw the line to say, this is a good distribution effect versus a not so good distribution effect. And, and finally, I, I think, I mean, what's the objective function, right? To put all these together. This may be cliche here. Are we talking about consumer welfare? final consumer welfare, 
or consumer welfare, including advertiser as the consumer of the ad market, for example, and or um, total welfare, that we sum up welfare of everybody, or we put some guardrail that's everybody should be subject to not too much worse off while we're maximizing those welfare. I, I think that's, that's um, I, I think that's still the hard question. Uh, I have a few other comments if I have time. Um, the first is the paper seems to give some example um, such as, okay, previously maybe some merchants happily advertising in a golf magazine, they catch the target audience of golfers for golf-related merchandise, but now with behavioral advertising, you have all kinds of people try to sell something to those golfers because those golfers may also um, want to buy, um, say, um, some some good digital gigas or um, want to travel, right? You get all kinds of mer merchants try to advertise, target this kind of golfer. So they end up competing with each other. They raise the price a lot, but the matching is not necessarily better just because we have all kinds of people um, competing for that. And it seems like there might be easy solutions. Say, what if we combining the behavioral advertising plus context advertising, maybe today's matching rate targeting accuracy is not so good, but are we on the road towards a perfect matching so that when we arrive there, it actually will be absolutely better? Um, so, so I don't know um, how to think about that as compared to the example they have. On the consumer um, trade-off, I feel like it's true that if we survey people over 70, 80, 90% people say they hate the ads, they wish the data was collected less. However, that's sort of not to me, that's not the right survey question. The survey question is, okay, what if you need to pay for something in order to be free of ads, to be free of data collection? How much are you willing to pay? It seems like not many people are willing to pay a lot um, for that, right? So, so implicitly, it's all of our choice to enable this kind of behavioral advertising and maybe opaque data collection. And I mean, definitely there are room to improve is that because the consumers are making this choice based on some uninformed setting, can we improve their um, information choice? Is the choice sort of limited because lack of competition? How can we enlarge that choice set so that um, people can make informed and meaningful and better choice? Um, but I see sometimes, I would say, uh, concerning conversation like, okay, the consumers may not be the right body to making this choice because Maybe the regulators know better. Okay, let's input a regulation so that um, the regulator can make a better choice and everybody would be better off. Um, I would be a little um, hesitant to go in that direction because we all know that political economy and regulator agencies probably would not guarantee that regulator will be the social planner in our textbook. So we have to consider and um, consider that. Uh, I think they have mentioned a little bit that's Maybe the industry can. Sorry to interrupt, Ginger, just in a few seconds. Oh, okay, yes, yeah. Uh, well, I would just put it there that maybe industry can do some self regulation. To some extent, we already see Apple offering some products, seems to be more privacy savvy. Okay, so is that a potential market solution without a regulation? And I will end on the final note that I know that uh, we have the concern that, okay, seems like there are enough danger, we should do something about it. So that's the risk of little action, but we probably need to trade that off versus the risk of wrong action. That's okay, what if we act on it, but we end up doing the wrong action? It's the non-desirable consequence of that small enough for us to not worry about that. I will end here. Thank you, Gigi. Um, UJ, what's your practitioner perspective on this paper? Very quickly, sorry. Uh, very quickly? Yes. Um, okay, I guess my main takeaway is that um, this paper presents a great summary of the empirical literature and how, challenge, how challenging it is to fully capture the, to, to fully measure the effects of uh, information sharing, and that's partly due to uh, the sort of the ephemeral nature of data as a valuable uh, product. It's something that I personally have struggled a lot as a PhD student. Whenever I present a theory paper, people would ask, what's your empirical evidence for that? It's really hard to find something that's comprehensive. Uh, I think that's probably going to stay that way. Uh, for, for example, the, the zero price problem um, Chris already introduced and for various other issues that 
the panel have very mouthfully discussed. Um, and I think as someone who has uh, gained more access as I work in the private sector, um, I think uh, a valuable channel of engagement would be try to push for more uh, transparency uh, on the platform who has a very intrinsic interest of showing their value um, and using whatever data that's available at, the, at their disposal. Uh, I think um, we knowing that this is uh, this would be uh, a motivated uh, line of motivated motivated reasoning. It would still be very informative for policymakers and researchers to closely examine the arguments being made and then to to look closely at what, whatever data is presented uh, and then still take you know learn more from it uh, in a sense um, from. Um, in a way that's not typically available to researchers who are just doing, who are just examining the problem on their own. Um, and then to end, um, and to end this note, I would also like to mention that as uh, economists and people in adjacent fields um, already have are well equipped of interpreting uh, uh, motivated reasoning. We know that even though, as long as people cannot fully fabricate evidence, uh, we are, there's always information to be extracted. Uh, from the arguments presented in court or in the public space. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? Eliana? In, uh, I think it was last October. Sorry. Last October, in response to the DMA, Facebook announced that it would put out a subscription model so you, that users would have the alternative to pay around, I think it was around 10 euros per month and not have their data used for tracking and advertisement. Uh, and, and, and somehow that was not well received, neither by privacy advocates and, and regulators. I mean, it's not, I don't know if they started, that sounds like a great experiment. Uh, I, haven't that, uh, I've, I haven't heard that mentioned, but I'm also curious to, you know, you think that's the solution everybody was looking for, and yet it seemed that it's not what is it that we're looking for? And that may be a question for mm -hmm. Cristóbal. So, so, yeah, I mean, that is a great example uh, because I think it, it really exemplifies like this, this argument that the industry has been making. I, I think that what Facebook did is, is very disingenuous because they didn't say you can opt out of tracking if you pay. They portrayed this as we serve you behaviorally targeted ads or no ads at all. And that is not really the problem. The problem is the privacy issue. So it's a world with behavioral targeting or a world with don't use my data to show me ads. Show me ads, that's fine. <laughs> Just don't mind my information and keep it for years and use it for purposes that uh, we don't know. Also, the price point is sort of interesting. I mean, it seems it was, I think, nine euros, but it was only for mobile. So if you also used... Um, if you also use Facebook on, on your desktop device, it was another 11 euros. So it was like 20 euros, per, uh, 20 euros per month. If you compare that to subscription services, I mean, it's a, it's a huge price. So it seems something like it's designed to, it's kind of designed to fail. So they can say, oh, look, nobody wants to pay for a world without, a, without nobody wants to pay to preserve privacy. When the option they were presenting was not exactly that. So I think it's interesting to explore, but I, I, I think the, it was done in, in sort of a tricky way. Thank you so much. Um, one last question. Right here. Um, Cristobal pointed out the difficulty measuring the causal connection between a targeted ad and a consumer decision to actually buy. And, and that reminded me, and it's been a long time since I've looked at this, but um, before the internet, a uh, common refrain that you would hear in the advertising industry was something like, half my advertising budget is wasted, but I don't know which half. And then the internet came along and what you would read was, half my advertising budget is wasted, but I don't know which half. <laughs> and, you know, if that's really the way advertisers feel, and that would require obviously some survey data or some other study, until you can get a handle on the causal connection, um, 
you're really not able to make an intelligent decision about what the trade-offs are. And I guess if I were a researcher, unfortunately I'm not, I'd, I'd be looking at that and I'd be looking for whatever insights you could get from um, behavioral economics, uh, which is developing, of course, um, to get at the non-rationality of the rational man. Thank you. One last comment before we go to break. So Google's obviously been thinking about this problem for quite some time, and just within the last two or three weeks, they've actually announced what they're going to do moving forward. It's something called protective, protected audiences, and what it essentially does is it allows you to, on your device, do the advertising. So you're more or less taken, you're broken down when you visit a website, it asks if you would be willing to be put into an interest group for the website, and then when you visit other websites, it pretty much takes your knowledge of that and is limited to the number of groups that you have. So you might have only three groups at a time, and your device actually does the ad auction on it. So that's what Google just announced that they're going to do moving forward. Can I comment one quick thing on that? Of course, quick. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting solution. And I think it highlights another issue that I think it's kind of thorny. Uh, what is the problem with behavioral advertising? Is it a data security problem, or is it a privacy problem? If it is a data, so the, the, what Google is suggesting is so it's solving the data security problem. So my data is no longer to be is going to be attributed to my name. Nobody can go into their database and learn what websites I have visited or what are the things that I like. But the, what Google can do is essentially the same as in the past. So to put a ridiculous example, let's say that behavioral targeting can be bad because if it identifies that I like gambling is going to, or I like heroin is going to show me gambling and heroin ads, and that is bad for me. Like, the solution that Google proposed is not solving that part of the problem. So I think it, it's, it's, I mean, I'm not saying it's bad, I think it's good, but it solves just one part of the problem. And the problem with behavioral ads is both. It's a privacy problem and it's a security problem. Thank you so much. I would like to thank my panelists for a great conversation. <laughs>